And these are the sounds of Australia. Now these ancient sounds are joined by a new sound. As dawn comes to the land down under, my morning silence is shattered by the sounds of competition. The Trans-Australia Ballooning Challenge. A celebration of my 200th year as a nation. For I am Australia. I am Earth, Wind and Fire. Join me now as I take you on an exciting journey. Up over, down under. Seventy-eight international balloon pilots and their crews have come to my shores from around the world to soar among the clouds in celebration of our bicentenary. These hot air balloon enthusiasts are here to compete in the ultimate aerial challenge that will take them across the broad expanse of a continent. countries will cross 6,000 kilometers of rugged outback in the longest and most difficult hot air balloon race ever attempted. This epic event begins in the west coast city of Perth, once home to the America's Cup yachting race, and ends a continent away in Sydney on the east coast of Australia. The philosophy of the race and its competitors is simple to take the bicentenary celebration to the people who live in my vast remote interior as the competition flies and drives its way across Australia. A caravan of 600 intrepid adventurers, 100 vehicles, support personnel and equipment making its way across this big friendly land, carrying with it the message of team spirit, stamina and friendly competition. For I am Australia, and this is my story. Day one of the competition, and the sun rises majestically over the city of Perth. All is in readiness for the first flight day, as the pilots assemble at the morning briefing. But the weather report confirms their early morning fears that the winds aloft are too high to allow the flight to take place. Just to go on. Forced to adhere to the tight schedule of the event so as to reach all the designated towns along the route. The caravan has no choice but to pack up and pull out of Perth en route to Meriton, a half day's ride to the east. The Australian Army balloon team is one of the first to arrive on the site. Their preparation is mirrored by other teams as anticipation grows in hopes of good weather and calm winds. Dawn, and there's guarded optimism that the first flight will take place. Task sheets and scoring markers are distributed to the pilots and crews as they make ready to chase the rising sun. But the flags at the launch site remind officials and balloonists alike that this is Australia, a land not easily conquered. And yet, on this windy morning, thousands of my people have gathered to witness the spectacle of flight. Crews and pilots from around the world meet and mingle with the locals. As if, by some grand design, the winds have carried a message of friendship and camaraderie to contestants and spectators alike. The sun will rise again, and with it, the promise of a day made for flight. It could last forever the balloon caravan leaves Meriden behind and heads for Kalgoorlie, a mining town which still produces two-fifths of the nation's gold. Here my face is scarred, 
silent tribute to my people's valiant effort to extract the treasures that lie beneath my surface. The winds are bent. It's time to fly. Challenge officials call for a fly-in, where pilots will be required to choose their own launch sites as they attempt to fly over a target beneath their balloons in the dusty town below. Brian Jurg's Dutch team discusses the long-awaited first flight as they plan their strategy. Joe Kittinger and Bob Snow of Rosie O'Grady's Flying Circus, an American entry, check the prevailing winds by using helium-filled balloons. Smoke rising from a nearby gold mine gives another clue to the direction of the all-important winds. The critical launch selection begins as crews attempt to find just the right departure point. Staking claim to the launch site becomes a race in itself. Tension mounts as pilots and crews race against time as the launch deadline approaches. The balloons are off soaring into the morning air over the rough terrain that glides beneath them. But tricky surface winds make the scoring area difficult to navigate, and few balloons make it over the scoring area. As the elegant balloons start the descent, the winds make landing difficult, even for these seasoned veterans of the air. The first day of real competition is ended, but it's time to meet the locals and enjoy their hospitality. Kalgoorlie, being a mining town, is known for its gold, its pubs, and its gambling. And gambling in Kalgoorlie means two up. A game where gamblers form a circle to wager on the flip of two coins thrown simultaneously into the air. Trying to go in here to turn up the heads, no crosses, just a lovely brown nothing. The turn of a big white cross. Sorry in Australia, you're a cactus. The night's festivities come to an end, and the pilots and crews turn their attention to the next official race site in Kimber. But to get there, the caravan must cross the forbidding Nullarbor. Squire, mounted on his thoroughbred, up jump the troopers, one, two, three. They said, where's that jolly jumper? You got tied up in your tucker bed, he said, you'll come a waltzing Matilda free. I lay before them over a thousand kilometers of vast treeless plain. A single ribbon of road, my only acceptance of civilization. For I am Australia, and this is the outback. The caravan arrives in Kimba, a remote farm community. Thousands have turned out to greet the balloonists as they bring the bicentenary celebration with them. A carnival of aerial adventure and special events are planned to mark this important day. The most important day since irrigation water was piped into Kimba 10 years ago. 
In a cultural exchange, the townspeople will learn something of the sport of ballooning. The balloonists will discover the fine art of sheep shearing. Up jumped the swagman and ran into the billy ball. You'll never take me alive, said he. And his ghost, it may be heard as you walk round by the billy ball to sing. You'll come a waltzing to your love. Eager to improve their standings in the competition, some teams continue to refine crew you skills. Always, you always want to handle the balloon along this line. The international flavor of this competition continues to spark the interest of spectators and participants alike. Australia and the United States have the most entries, followed by the United Kingdom, Canada, and Japan. Teams from Yugoslavia, Poland, and Hungary represent the Eastern Bloc. Race time approaches, and for the first of two races in Kimber, the challenge officials have decided to run an event called Hare and Hounds. The yellow and green hair balloon takes off ahead of the pack, distinguished from the hound balloons by flowing streamers attached to its surface. When the hare reaches its destination, the crew hurries to set up the target cross. Back at the launch site, the hounds take up the chase, but gusty winds make taking off a real challenge. Yet with extreme effort and uncanny skill, 78 multicolored balloons finally take to the sky. But knowing in the future lies a time when we must part again Until the moment when the first joy of my day We'll be watching you waking in the morning light And your smile that makes it all seem right As we steal another precious day and fly away The lead balloons zero in on the target zone. The winning toss of the day is worth a thousand points, but any team who gets relatively close can score valuable points. West Germany's Eric Kraft approaches the target. Woo! You do it! Joe Gettinger from America picks up points with his toss, while his chase crew keeps him in sight. We're going to one right now. The winner after the day's events turns out to be David Levin of the United States. It's got to be at least a meter, David. I can't measure under that. Beautiful. <laughs> It's evening, 
and the townspeople of Kimber give the contestants a street party, which includes a special Aussie event, a keg rolling contest. Morning, and the second race day in Kimber. But this morning, the winds are up, and the challenge crews are in for a tough day aloft. surface winds proved to be too much for two of the teams, as two crew people are hurt. A Danish woman has a broken leg and internal injuries. A French co-pilot has injured an ankle. But the competition must go on. The crews will lick their wounds and fly another day. Once a jolly swag Camped down by her billabong Under the shade and he sang as he watched and waited till his belly bowed. He sang, You'll come a waltzing Tilda with me. To drink at the billabong Up jumped the swagman And grabbed him with me And he sang as he showed That jump up in his tucker bag He sang You'll come a waltzing Matilda with me things in this land down under. Next stop on the Bicentennial Balloon Challenge, the wine country of the Borossa Valley. Only a day's ride from Kimber, the countryside takes on a more gentle look. Here, my lush green fields are planted in vineyards, over which the next race will take place. The officials call for another hare and hound competition. A local winery supplies the hair balloon. Liftoff occurs just after dawn. On the launch field, the racing balloons, appearing as a vast bed of multicolored flowers reaching up to the rising sun. The wind is still. This is an ideal day for flying. The first joy of my day is knowing that you will be a part of it. That you'll be at the very heart of it When your eyes caress me like the warming rays of the morning sun The next joy of my day Is drifting with you upon the morning breeze Floating high above the earth where no one sees Where the air is still and sweet And two hearts can beat as one But knowing in the future lies a time when we must part again Until the moment when the first joy of my day 
We'll be watching you waking in the morning light And your smile that makes it all seem right As we steal another precious day and fly away Balloons are here from all over the world, in all shapes and sizes. The Louis Vuitton balloon from France features an inflated representation of the famous Sydney Opera House on its crown. Other unusually shaped balloons include a flying LP gas tank and an inflatable jetliner. The aerial formation of 78 balloons floats skyward. The spectacle is almost musical. your limits and to work within them is part of knowing yourself and to me this event is a philosophy of life when I'm in a balloon basket I realize there are no boundaries there are no limits that it's something that we put on ourselves on on the ground and and to understand that is a wonderful knowledge to achieve in life Australian Peter Consul, pilot of the media balloon, flies close to the Louis Vuitton crew for a glass of champagne. This is ballooning in the French tradition. Chris Kirby and his British crew break out its one-man balloon appropriately called a cloud hopper. It takes an army of people to put on an event such as this. Ruth Wilson, challenge director, has spent three years organizing this transcontinental ballooning challenge. A champion pilot in her own right, Ruth sees this event as a labor of love, her gift to Australia on its 200th birthday as a nation. When the Bicentennial Authority asked me in 83, early 83 to sit on the Aviation Committee to choose a program for ADA, this idea came very naturally to me. It's not just a ballooning event, it's a challenge. It's an endurance event. It's about surviving 16 days of 18 hours activity each day, of ballooning competitively in the morning, driving in the afternoon the distances three to four hours to the next location, and then socializing that night with the local people in the communities who've organized fun activities for us to mix with their people in their town. Ruth has two sons who share her love of ballooning. Mark, her 20-year-old, and the competition's youngest pilot, has taken top honors in today's event. One of the many challenges faced by organizers of this event has been how to refuel 78 balloons in some of the most remote and desolate country in the world. The answer to the question? Gary Anderson and his crew who have hauled the liquid propane needed to feed these hungry, soaring giants across the outback, across a continent. Fred Brown, one of the balloon pilots, has high praise for the refuel crew and their system. They do an excellent job here. They can refuel a lot of balloons in a very short period of time, and it's all done under safe conditions. They have shutoffs, and so they can isolate it. If anybody had a problem, they can isolate it right quick. The challenge moves on, deeper into the fertile wine country of southern Australia. What do you want? It's early morning in Mildura, and the weather is once again a factor. 
Allez, 1, 2. Pilots and crews are placed on standby as the brace officials wait to see if the winds will subside. Balloon teams put the delay time to good use as they check the latest challenge standings. American entry David Levin is leading the field. Masahito Fujita of Japan is close behind in second place. Darrell Stewart and the Australian Army team are strongly entrenched in third place. Has been going anyway. The weather hold is lifted. Balloon crews make their way to the launch area. Race officials have designated a target. After all the anticipation and excitement, the Great Bicentennial Balloon Challenge was hit by adverse weather conditions yet again. Just after 7.30, straight after the pilot's briefing meeting, the black flag went up and it was all over for Muldura. I want to fill it with air. I want to fill it with air. Because we got a sponsor. Oh, okay. Uh, David Levin and his team make the decision to inflate their balloon in spite of the high winds. Levin and his crew seem determined to give the crowd something to photograph. Okay, we need the bottom of the basket pulled out. And, uh, get a fan back on. Okay. Take your pictures, we're only going to do it another minute. If we didn't take our vitamin E, we couldn't do it. Come on, fast! The townspeople mingle with the earthbound balloonists, and many make a stop at the nearby souvenir stand to purchase a memento of the day's events. Matthias de Bruin from the Netherlands introduces his family balloon team to friendly onlookers. We were here two years ago, also with a family crew. My wife was there and my, her elder sister was there. And uh, at that time we won the Open Australian Championships. So I thought, why not bring the family again? It brought me luck that time. <laughs> Everybody knows what they're doing, I take it by now. Yes, yes. We do it 10 years already. We do it with, 10 years. With three children. And that helps a lot. Everybody knows what he's doing, what he's capable to do and what not to do. It's, sometimes it's even more important that people are willing to help, but they uh, but do the wrong things. And that things in the, like in the family crew, that doesn't happen. Everybody knows precisely yeah, yeah. what to do. The caravan moves on as the competition nears its end. Number four, first row, go right to the last site. Okay. You can find no numbers on the ground. Next stop, Broken Hill, so a day's ride to the north. Broken Hill is known for its silver mines and rugged terrain. Also located here are the headquarters of the Royal Australian Flying Doctor Service. This country's unique method of providing vital medical attention to remote outback locations. 170.4. What's that? To? Oh, hey. See that toilet? That's fucking awesome. Senate. 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 Senate.
which just that one there yeah. with the towel on it. The Australian Army balloon team sets up on the launch field. The team has become a well-oiled flying machine, depending heavily on high-tech information. The Army plots a course. Three, two, one, go on. Wind direction is three, four, five. Three, four, five. Read. Reading at three, one decimal nine, and three, four, one decimal one. Four, three, two, one. Read. The green flag goes up, and the Australian Army balloon is first in the air. Their launch is a study in precision, efficiency, and timing. David Levin's balloon is ready to lift off, but he holds his position on the ground and waits for more balloons to take off, enabling him to better judge the winds. Surface winds increase as the launch continues. The remaining earthbound balloons must deal with the higher wind velocity at ground level. competitors seek out the Silverton Hotel, a favorite watering hole for the locals, as well as an old Western-style saloon, which has served as a backdrop for several major motion pictures filmed in the air. How's the auto? How's the opposition? What? Doing fine, doing fine. Downtown. Downtown. You've heard of Silverton, right? Some of the other balloonists seek a diversion of a different kind as they climb aboard native camels for a tour of the Silverton ghost town. The time approaches for the afternoon race. The wind velocity increases, putting the flight in jeopardy. Pilots and crews attend a pre-flight briefing where they listen to Wally Williams explain his scientific methods of wind prediction. And it's calibrated in, uh, what do you call it? Wally's. Uh, Wally. In spite of the lighter moment, race officials are forced to cancel the afternoon flight. But an announcement is made that pilots can fly at their own risk if they wish to try a mid-air pickup of a silver ingot. This $8,000 prize has been supplied by the town of Broken Hill and has been suspended high atop a cherry picker, dangling like some juicy bunch of grapes right for the taking. But as the pilots would discover, this will be easier said than done.
hundreds of onlookers have gathered to meet the balloonists and watch the attempt for the silver ingot. At first, it looks as though the wind will be the only winner today. But suddenly, a balloon is spotted on the horizon. It's Jerry Elkins and his Wyoming crew from America. The big airship soars into Broken Hill. But as the winds of fate would have it, the team flies well wide of the target and comes to Earth just outside the town. The contest deadline is sundown, so the crew hurries to load up and return to the launch site for another try at the prize. Another balloon team attempts to launch under the windy conditions for their try at the silver ingot. It's Alistair Russell's Canadian team, battling the winds as they manage to get airborne. The Wyoming crew scrambles to beat the launch deadline, as other pilots and crew personnel lend a helping hand. The balloon leaves the ground, just ahead of the sunset deadline. Those boys from Wyoming are on their way for a second attempt. The Canadian balloon is way off target. They'll have no chance at the silver ingot. But the balloon from the United States appears to be right on target. The crowd below responds to cheer them on. The balloon descends, but it's falling too fast. The team misses the target and flies into a nearby house. Flames leap up from the sides of the craft, but miraculously they're extinguished, and certain disaster is averted. Fortunately, no one's badly injured in the mishap, but no one was able to win the ingot. The competition will go on, for I am Australia, and tomorrow is another day. Trans Australia Ballooning Challenge finds itself in Dubbo, last stop of the competition. The morning sun greets a number of balloonists as they make pleasure flights over the area to get the lay of the land. Recent heavy rains have cloaked this farming area in a lush coat of green, as if to welcome the challenge in a grand display of natural beauty. The animals of the area seem to sense that something is about to take place here. The reclusive koala already has a vantage point from which to watch the race. Horses run and romp and seem to compete with the balloons as they soar above them. And the kangaroos act as if they've become the official escort for this grand parade of soaring craft. As some of the balloons return to Earth, one gets a real sense of the speed of landing as the basket skims over the treetops. Australian balloonist Barry Bristow Skag demonstrates the technique of drag landing. A large crowd is gathered at the launch site as the scheduled afternoon event draws close. Details of the task are distributed to pilots and crews. <laughs> Wally the weatherman is optimistic that good flying weather will prevail. Unfortunately, tricky thermals at higher altitudes have developed, and race officials decide to cancel the afternoon competition in the interest of safety, even though there's only one day left to complete the Bicentennial Challenge. 
Dawn, the last day, and conditions have improved. Everyone will fly today, including the balloon from Wyoming, badly damaged in the fire at Broken Hill. Repairs on the balloon were accomplished by using material donated by other competitors, so everyone would have a chance to compete in this last event. In the final competition, pilots will be required to hit two targets, one after the other, approximately one mile apart, each task being scored separately. The balloons are inflated. Pilots and crews stand by. Cameraman Laurie Gilbert is harnessed to the media balloon basket to capture all the action from the sky. The competition's first prize of $20,000 is up for grabs. It's anybody's race to win. The point spread is narrow. 16 teams still have a shot at winning. With no weather problems in the area and all the contestants eager to do their best in the final flight, the townspeople watching the race from below will get quite a show. the first target zone and bombard scoring officials with some very accurate tosses. The Rosie O'Grady balloon moves in for its attempt at the target beneath them. The Canadian team, piloted by Alistair Russell, scores well on target, but is nearly disqualified as his basket comes very close to touching the ground while still in flight. Australian pilot Aidan Wicks is not so lucky as his balloon touches the ground and is disqualified. David Levin, leader in the overall competition, makes his final toss. He's the man to catch, and it appears that he'll retain his lead in this event. Only a few balloons make it to the second target. The Australian Army team scores top honours here, with David Levin scoring a close second place toss. Back on the ground, the Australian Army crew awaits the final results. They've beaten America's David Levin in today's event by the closest of margins. But will it be enough to nullify the slim lead he carried into the final day? Australian pilot Daryl Stewart is unsure of the outcome. How did you do? We threw 0.7 and 2.3. Be 11 on both tasks. Not by necessarily a lot. Levin arrives on the scene, and the American and the Aussie compare notes. I think it'll only be like no more than four points. Yeah, it's all on the first call. Yeah, which would be three, three meters. Three point two. Three point two. And you went three. When all is said and done, and the final tabulations are completed, the victory belongs to David Levin. Caravan leaves the outback behind and makes its way towards Sydney, final destination of the Trans Australia Ballooning Challenge. The final morning, and Bankstown Airport is veiled in a thick fog. Although weather prohibits a launch, several crews inflate and tether their balloons on an airport taxiway in one final tribute to the challenge and to Australia. 78 balloonists have traversed a continent and brought Australia's bicentenary celebration to its people, who are so much a part of this great land. The event has made history, and there are no losers. I'm a 
waltz in Matilda with me. Sunset, and this vast continent sleeps again. For I am Australia, the land down under. A land known to many, but understood by few. This is the land of my people. A special place, suspended in time. And this has been my story. A story as old as yesterday, and as new as tomorrow. For I am Australia forever. If we put our trust in these gentle guns, they'll make us 